All right, now one of the reasons that we're really interested in using the analysis of variance is to control um, the negative consequences of making multiple comparisons using the same data set especially. Multiple comparisons in general are problematic. They're especially problematic when you have the same data set. So uh, we're very concerned in statistics with trying to prevent ourselves from making type 1 errors. Now we don't like to make type 2 errors either, but you have to be especially careful with type 1 because that, those are really tempting because you want to discover something. You want to say that you've shown that the world is a different place from what you understood before, etc. I mean, you want to be a scientist and a successful one. So we're tempted to do that. And there are all sorts of ways that we can cheat without even realizing that we're cheating with, um, with statistics. And if you don't realize it, that's the worst kind. To be wrong and not know you're wrong, that's the worst way to be wrong. So the learning objectives here, we just need to describe the benefits of using ANOVA over performing lots of t-tests for doing comparisons between the means of three or more groups. Now with two groups, it's pretty easy to compare the means. You don't have to worry about this extra type 1 alpha business. You just set your alpha level and you've controlled alpha as long as you did reasonably good research. But with three means, there's a problem. So if you have more than two groups, naturally, and before R.A. Fisher came along and uh, invented the analysis of variance a hundred years ago or so, um, naturally people would think if you have more than two groups, what you have to do is compare all different pairs. So if you have three groups, then you have to compare group A to B and then do another t-test or something to compare A to C and then do a third one to compare B to C and that's the only way you can really understand if there are differences between these groups. But that leaves us open to the problem of inflated type 1 error because of doing multiple tests. Now you have type 1 error on every individual trial. So think of each t-test that you perform with an alpha of 0.05 like rolling a 20-sided die. So there's a 20-sided die. It's a gigantic one. Most of them are somewhat smaller than that. So think of each t-test that you perform in a study, like rolling a 20-sided die. Uh, there's a 1 in 5 chance that it will come up a 1, for instance. So let's just pick one of the numbers, a 1. There's a 1 in 5 chance that it will come up a 1. So that's like, that's like performing a t-test when the null hypothesis is actually true. Of course, you don't know if the null hypothesis is true, but if it is, then one in five times, with alpha with an alpha level of 0.05, one in or sorry, one in 20 times, you will be wrong in that terrible way that is a type one error. You will think you found something when in fact you didn't. You reject the null hypothesis when you should not have done that. So that's what happens if the null hypothesis is true. So we need to ask ourselves, if you're going to do multiple tests, what is the probability of at least one type 1 error across those different tests, rather than just focusing only on the probability of a type 1 error in one test if the null hypothesis is true? Well, if the null hypothesis is true, what's the probability of at least one type 1 error on multiple tests? So this is a probability issue. It's sort of like saying every individual toss of a coin, the probability of it coming up heads is 0.5. But if you step back and say, if I toss the coin you know, 12 times, what's the probability that it will come up heads at least once? Much, much higher than point, point 0.5. But now we've got 0.05, because that's what we usually set our alpha to. At least that's, that's probably the most common alpha level chosen. So it's like rolling a 20-sided die. So we can say, what's the probability of rolling at least one uh, roll of one on multiple rolls of the die? What if you roll the, roll the die five times or 10 times? What's the probability of it coming up as a one at least once in all those different roles. Well, we can figure out those probabilities because probability theory uh, does that. That's, that's its job. So imagine a drug study. Let's say you have three groups. And it's actually quite common in drug studies to have multiple groups. So group A is your placebo, group B is drug one, and group C is drug number two when you're comparing them for something or other. Um, you have some dependent variable, but those are your different groups. What do we really want to know about that? Often we want to know all paired differences. That, that's not what we always want to know, but frequently we want to know what are all the possible differences between pairs of means. So does group A respond better to the drug than group B? So does the placebo group have a better response than, group, than, the, than the drug one group? Does the placebo group respond better than drug two? Um, does drug two, drug one respond better than group two, drug two? So we want to see which of these things is 
gives you a higher response and by how much. So we want to do significance tests. We want to do three t-tests there. That would f help us figure this out. We do a t-test for A versus B and one for A versus C and one for B versus C. We do three t-tests to figure that out. Well, the problem comes in that you just did three t-tests and whether you recognize it or not, probability is just part of the way the universe works as far as we know. It's math and physics and so whether you realize it or not, you've just inflated one aspect of your type 1 error rate. Now in each individual test, so this test here, A versus B, your type 1 error rate is 0.05, meaning if the null hypothesis is true, if you've set alpha at 0.05 and said I will not reject the null hypothesis unless my p-value is less than 0.05, if that's the case, then alpha is 0.05, the probability of falsely rejecting a null hypothesis, so rejecting a null hypothesis that was really true, is only 5% because that assumes that the null hypothesis is true. But it's 5% in this one, and it's 5% in this one. So it's like rolling a die, but you roll it three times. The probability of it coming up one here is 5%, and one here is 5%, and the probability of rolling a one here is 5%. But we want to know what's the probability of rolling a one at least somewhere among all of those three things, because that's another important aspect of the type 1 error rate that we need to manage. Why do we need to manage that? Because we are certainly going to interpret things. We're going to jump on those results and say, hey, look what we found. And it's not fair, it's cheating to, do, to take that approach to your tests if you have not accounted for the possibility that at least one of those things, and possibly the one you're looking at right now, was a spurious finding. So you need to look at those, at those possibilities. So when we figure out these possibilities, we often just use a simple matrix. Um, you put the, all the groups in the rows and in the columns, and then the, the values in the matrix are all the possible comparisons. But not all the values are things we're interested in, so we're not actually going to compare A versus A. We're not going to do a t-test of one group versus itself. It's meaningless. Of course, you'll find there's no difference because they're the same thing. So we don't do that. We don't do any of those things on the diagonal there, not A versus A, B versus B, or C versus C. And then we find that there's redundancies. B versus A and A versus B. A t-test is symmetrical. It doesn't matter if you say A versus B or B versus A. I mean, you might get a negative 2.3 t-observed versus positive 2.3, but it's the same result. It's the same numbers, just remixed. It's symmetrical, so you don't need both of these. So get rid of one of these triangles, the upper or the lower triangle. So let's get rid of the lower triangle. So once you get rid of all the redundancies, that tells you how many t-tests there are. There are three. Three possible comparisons for a group of three, uh, for three different groups. Um, so there's three possible t-tests that you could compare. Each of those t-tests will, will have an alpha level of 0.05. So what's the probability of at least one t-test erroneously finding that the null hypothesis is false if, in fact, the null hypothesis is really true. So if the null hypothesis is true, unbeknownst to us, then what's the probability, not of an individual one finding that, uh, rejecting the null hypothesis falsely, because each of them is 0.05 probability of doing that, uh, but of at least one of them doing so. And it turns out that that probability is 0.14. That's not quite as simple as just adding them together. You have to do something a little bit more funky in this case. But it does grow. So you've got three t-tests. Actually, you think your alpha is 0.05, but across all the tests, the family-wise error rate, or sometimes called the experiment-wise error rate, the error rate across all of them of at least one type 1 error happening, if the null hypothesis is true, now has, has risen to 0.14. If you're not aware of that, then you're basically you're, you're making science cry on its pillow late at night because you're a bad person and a horrible scientist. So we call that alpha... FW sometimes. Some, some people have different um, labels. We have a whole bunch of different abbreviations. Sometimes you'll say, it's just see capital FWER, the family-wise error rate. Some people will call it the experiment-wise error rate. And uh, the thing I've seen slightly more common than, often than others is alpha sub FW. So family-wise alpha is 0.14. So what if we have four groups? Well, now we need six t-tests because there's all of our comparisons. We got rid of the diagonals and the lower triangle, which are all redundant. There are six t-tests. Each of them has an alpha of 0.05. If we do all the six of those t-tests, so compare all those groups to each other, all possible comparisons, then what's the true error rate, the family-wise error rate there? Now it's 
Now we have over a 1 in 4 chance of making at least one type 1 error. If you have 5 groups, now you need 10 t-tests. This multiplies really, really quickly. There's all the possible t-tests between 5 separate groups, comparing all groups to one another. With these 10 t-tests, they're each tested at alpha is 0.05. Now this is different if it's 0.01, for instance, but alpha is 0.05 for each of them. Family-wise error rate is 0.4. So it's getting kind of ridiculous, right? So just to uh, top this off, let's say, what about if there were eight groups? You would need 28 t-tests. You'd need all those t-tests right there. 28 t-tests, that's a lot. So with all those groups, each of those tests has an alpha, an alpha level of 0.05, and the probability that you've made at least one mistake of the type 1 variety, if the null hypothesis is true, is now 0.76. So we're getting it's even greater than half. It's three quarters. You're almost guaranteed at a certain number to get at least one type 1 error if the null hypothesis is true. This means you can't trust your results. It means that when you find a result you can't really say, hey look what I found because this type 1 error is lurk lurking in the background. This family-wise error rate that says you did a whole bunch of tests there's an increasing chance that the result you just zeroed in on, because you looked across all 28 of these results and you only got interested in the ones where, um, where p is less than 0.05, right? You, you, you were willing to be kind of uh, opportunistic in deciding which of these results you were going to make a big deal out of. Well, in that case, then the stats need to be including this family-wise error rate. And so that's ridiculously high. You're probably wrong. You, well, if the null hypothesis is true, you're probably wrong. And we're using this to try and judge whether the null hypothesis should be considered to be supported or not supported. Therefore, the whole thing is really very messed up. So controlling type 1 error, to do that in individual tests, we just set alpha, right? But to do that across multiple tests, family-wise error rate, then we set we try and control our family-wise alpha, and we try and control it the same way that somebody would control alpha by just setting it. Um, but it gets a little bit more complicated than that, because if we're going to do multiple tests, if we're interested in multiple hypotheses, then it's not as easy sometimes as just setting family-wise alpha, because f setting family-wise alpha means we have to do something across all the tests. Now, there are some simple ways to do that, but they tend to be pretty painful. Uh, conservative, we might say. They reduce the probability of finding uh, a significant result, and they reduce it by too much. So they increase the type 2 error rate quite a lot. So one of the things we do is we do one overall test. The first test we do is like a gateway test, and this is a very common strategy. We say, is there at least one pair of means that differs? So say you've got those eight means from that study that I hypothetically described a minute ago. The first question you could answer, you could ask is, is there somewhere in here at least one pair of means that is different from each other, like in the population? So can we find at least one statistically significant difference in all, this, all these 28 possibilities? Now if we could do that without actually having to look at all 28, if we could do that with a single test with only one alpha that we're messing with, and, not, and so that's not uh, increasing any family-wise error rate because there's only one test. If we could do that, that would be nice. And that's the F test in the analysis of variance. The analysis of variance, the, the core element of it is the F test. It's a single test to determine whether the means are all the same in the population, null hypothesis, or whether they're not all the same in the population, alternative hypothesis. Of course it doesn't determine that, but it's, it tells us whether that's plausible or not, whether the evidence is consistent with the null hypothesis of them all being the same or whether it's more consistent with something else. So we do the analysis of variance. The null hypothesis is that all the means in the population are the same. The alternative, which we almost never write in symbols because it gets too complicated, is that not all the population means are equal. Or you can say at least one pair of means differs. And so if you reject that null hypothesis with that one test and you've only used up one alpha level, you haven't got this whole pool of them like if you did a whole bunch of t-tests. If you do that one test and you find out that there's at least one test that's different, it's like you're the cop pulling somebody over and now you have reasonable suspicion. You smelled alcohol or you saw an open container, so now you're going to actually look in the trunk or now you're going to have them get out on the, 
on the ground and do the breathalyzer test or something like that, or walk along that line and touch their nose. You've got reasonable suspicion that there might be something else there. And the reason the law says you need reasonable su suspicion is pretty much the same as the reason statistics practice says do the ANOVA, the, the F test first, the um, omnibus test first. Because that kind of keeps you in check and keeps you from just checking everything and therefore finding some random stuff that really isn't very meaningful. So, but that one test doesn't answer all of our questions. So with ANOVA, we usually have a two-step procedure. Step number one, we do the F test, and we'll talk quite a bit about how to do that and how to calculate it. And step number two, we can follow up with some individual t-tests. Now we could do all possible individual t-tests, but it's much more satisfying and it's much more believable and defensible in scientific publications and things if you only have a few t-tests that you're really interested in, or, or at least not all of them especially if you've got a large number of means. If there's only three or four or five t-tests possible, yeah, do them all. Nobody's going to be really weird about that. But if you've got 10 or 15 or 28, then, yeah, that's, that's problematic. You probably shouldn't be doing all those because you probably should be smart enough to have some more specific hypotheses. You should have done your research. You should have read up on what's going on in the background literature, so you should have some more targeted specific hypotheses. Once again, statistics punishes you for not knowing things and rewards you for knowing things. If you know the literature and you know which hypotheses you should be looking for, then you have an easier time of it and you're more likely to find a significant result and other scientists will not think you're stupid. So even when we do these multiple means, after we did that sort of gateway strategy of saying, I won't even look at individual means unless the F test is significant first, unless I have this reasonable suspicion there, this probable cause, even then we correct our individual, our multiple comparisons, so that the overall family-wise error rate is not above some reasonable value, like 0.05, or sometimes people say 0.10 if there's a whole bunch. So that's the first thing we do. So number one, we do our omnibus test with ANOVA. Number two, we ask, is that omnibus test significant, the F test? If it's not, then you stop, you're done, you go home. You write up your results and say, we didn't find anything. If it is, then you continue. And you do follow-up comparisons of pairs of groups. But even those follow-up comparisons are controlled for family-wise error rate. So that's the strategy, two steps. I mean, there's three things here, but one of them is just a comparison, just a decision point. Number one, omnibus test. Number two, second step, we follow up with comparisons of individual group means in pairs, in t-tests essentially, sometimes literally in t-tests, and uh, we only do that if the omnibus test was significant. So next test, next uh, lecture, we're going to talk a little bit more about that test.